Elsevier kept around 40% of the money it earned last year compared to typical publishers of about 10 to 20%. Scientific publishers share journals, which are made up of articles that people can read. Governments pay universities. University employees write the articles. Other university employees review those articles, often without additional pay. Then universities buy the articles off the publishers. In this system, scientific publishers like Reed Elsevier only work as a middleman and pocket the money. How most of their money is earned, some calling this a triple pay system. An article from 2003 said, Costs of publication, subscription, and access charges are now a perverse and needless obstacle. And another article in 2015 said, While it's true that publishers have historically played a vital role in the dissemination of scientific knowledge in the print era, it is questionable whether they are still necessary in today's digital era. But academic institutions need money for salaries, equipment, facilities, and much more. To me, it looks like the source of this problem is bad incentives. Scientists need to secure funding for their research, and increasingly, that depends on attracting public attention to their work. Universities receive grants from governments, private companies, and non-profit organizations. However, grant success is heavily influenced by age, gender, scientific rank, faculty research, peer quality, program size, and faculty publication and citation numbers. The H index is often used to measure an author's impact, output, and performance. An author with a higher H index will likely get more grants, but more publications aren't always better. The maximum H index is their total publications, but only if each paper has that amount or more of citations. But authors can cite themselves, and as part of the peer review process, they could also influence other authors for citations. Each publisher tracking the publication and citation numbers to calculate the H index. This means publishers can show different H index values for the same author. Comparing authors across research fields is unfair, as some fields may get more citations due to more or less publications in that field. And then a similar calculation is done for journals, the impact factor being used to measure average article citations. This could use data from the past five years, but it often uses the last two years. Number of citations divided by publications for the years considered. Higher impact factor journals potentially suggesting more influence, so those authors looking for higher citation numbers likely aiming for higher impact journals, so they can increase their H index, therefore increasing likelihood of grant success and funding, all controlled by the publishers. Some argue publishers help with vetting, sharing, and explaining science. However, increased traction in the motto, publish or perish, could have resulted in limited value in published research and or unethical practices. Academic misconduct, like copying others' work in various ways. Probability hacking, where researchers test just enough to find a significance to publish. Citation hacking, where scientists get others to reference their own work inflating their numbers. Image duplication and or manipulation. Harking hypothesizing after the results are known, or making up the hypothesis after you found the results. Data tampering, where numbers are adjusted or made up to find a significance, leading to so-called paper mills. Oh, there's several paper mills. Yeah, so a paper mill, a scientific paper mill, there, there are companies that make falsified papers. When I found a paper mill that looked fairly realistic, but um, that was a, uh, it was a paper about prostate cancer, and half of the patients were female, were, men, were, were women. And you're like, that's <laughs> unexpected. Those cutting corners arguing it helps them get published and get the grant money for further research. But publishers vet those publications. Submissions go to editors, sometimes well-paid, but often low-pay or volunteers, then going to review by low-pay or volunteer researchers. A survey finding 77% of reviewers wanting further peer review training. The publisher vetting or peer review process has limitations. Artificial intelligence impacting all parts of this process? 
The Australian Research Council, responsible for granting more than 800 million Australian dollars each year to academics and researchers, found one assessor seeing regenerate response in a report, which is text that could have been accidentally copied from ChatGPT responses. ChatGPT has passed medical, legal, reading and writing exams in the top 90th percentile, but it still makes lots of errors. The assessor saying, I think it's a sign of someone being overworked and trying to cut corners, which is being done by the researchers, sometimes leaving the AI text in the papers. So if we go all the way down and we look for as an AI language model, you can see they just put in this question and then it says as an AI language model, blah, blah, blah. I don't have direct access. They've actually just copied and pasted exactly what it says. This whole paragraph here is direct copy and paste from ChatGPT. But some people trying to detect well-used AI misconduct have said it's becoming increasingly difficult to distinguish between writing produced by AI and writing produced by a person. Using AI to detect AI is one option, but AI detectors can be easily tricked by simply adjusting punctuation. AI detectors can also make mistakes like suggesting human writing was AI. A paper published to highlight this issue and others after the paper's conclusion says, as the alert reader may already have guessed, everything up to this point in the paper was written directly by ChatGPT. Three peer reviewers reported in feedback that they initially believed the paper was written by a person before reaching the reveal that it was written by AI. Elizabeth Bick, someone tackling academic misconduct, has found over 4,000 paper manipulations. Ivan Aransky launched Retraction Watch with Adam Marcus, which shares examples daily. Papier continues countless post-published conversations about research practices and potential misconduct. Vroni Plag Wiki tackling plagiarism in published dissertations. But they all say well done misconduct is hard to find and even harder to prove. Publishers struggling, consultants struggling, volunteers involved all over the process struggling. So the so called best journals struggle in not just social sciences but medical and hard sciences. A recent study estimated that. 28% or some 300,000 papers in the biomedical field alone may be fake. One published paper had get me off your mailing list repeated over and over for 10 pages. Every field struggles with academic misconduct, meaning retractions, corrections and reproductions of findings could have more value now more than ever. Something publishers are again in control over. But considering Elizabeth's wish list, including publishers acting faster with retractions and corrections, being stricter with retractions, not just correcting an error, and asking publishers to accept more replications, the publishers have room for improvement. In the print era, when people read physical papers, publishers were vital for sharing science. Now in the digital era, Social media platforms like ResearchGate, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn all do the sharing or contacting the author directly for a preprint, manuscript or a physical copy. Some argue publishers help surfacing papers, but I couldn't find much data to support that claim unless you consider database tools like Scopus as publisher specific promotion. Not forgetting predatory publishers who share journals that are essentially fake, publishing any author who pays. When we consider public sharing, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, news articles and magazines, they all have the science says, evidence shows content with a picture or reference to the paper. Overhyping science discoveries can give people a false sense of how science works. Like if that latest discovery I hear about turns out to be false, what else could be untrue? My guess is that gets more views and shares than what the publishers and predatory publishers do. And arguments for explaining science are often combated with comments like, it is often the writing rather than the science that makes these articles difficult to read. With the publisher's only impact on writing quality, the editors, many of which are volunteers and rely heavily on the often volunteer researchers. You could argue publisher's impact is limited. Yet, publishers add paywalls totaling global revenues of more than £19 billion a year. And 
A 2013 study, for example, reported that half of all clinical trials in the US are never published in a journal. They argue due to lack of significance, because publishers look for significant science, not all science. But science relies on sharing. If sharing with others costs authors thousands to publish it for everyone to read without paying, researchers may find other solutions. But when you consider universities pay publishers subscription fees for access, Harvard quoting $500,000 for a year, university costs increase. But they need money, which could impact things like increased tuition fees, books, rooms, food for students. Publishers increasing student and researcher expenses, not only to study, create and consume science, but also to share science. So publishers get articles for free, edited with low or no cost, reviewed with low or no cost, then sold. Or publishers get paid quite a lot of money for the same editing and review to publish articles with free access. Their expenses being editing, understandable, but also producing, marketing and sharing articles, most of which could seemingly be done online for low or no cost. The H index and impact factor being of unique value for scientific publishers, alongside upholding standards through editors and peer review. But maybe there are other solutions online. However, publishing isn't free. Pay the researcher, pay the editor, reviewer, publisher, be that hosting platforms or something else. Alexandra created an illegal library of scientific articles because she didn't like the paywalls, but her work was community-supported before Elsevier lobbied to shut that down. One person said, After my cancer diagnosis this year, I was offered a choice of treatments. I wanted to make an informed decision. This meant reading scientific papers. Had I not used the stolen material provided by illegal library, it would have cost me thousands. Apart from videos and word of mouth, the library is hidden due to legal sanctions. Publishers lobbied for a bill preventing private research sharing without going through publishers. But the American Chemical Society, ACS, filed and won a lawsuit for copyright infringement and trademark violation adding legal sanctions, demanding any internet search engines, web hosting and internet service providers, domain name registrars and domain name registries stop doing anything to make illegal library operation and piracy possible. So promoting or supporting the library can have legal consequences. James Milne, a spokesperson for Elsevier, argues it is convenience. Aaron Schwartz was another example trying to bypass paywalls. He sought to release 5 million scientific articles into the public domain. Facing the possibility of decades in a US federal prison for this selfless act, he took his life. Elsevier doesn't oppose open access. A spokesperson said, I can say with confidence that all the members of the coalition, Elsevier included, embrace open access. What they want is copyright laws to be followed, and the money that goes with that. Despite academia having self-correcting systems in place, some argue it often lacks the support and transparency necessary to be maximally effective. Ideas like double-blind review, paid review, public review, online publication instead of private publication, all suggestions. Actually, publish our publishers are... are slowly changing their course are actually getting better in retracting papers but institutions are are lagging they're they're still more out there to protect their their staff their faculty stm integrity hub helping with maintaining scientific integrity cope promoting scientific integrity niso helping with peer review standards but the ultimate responsibility for guaranteeing the publication usually rests with the first senior, and corresponding authors. But bad actors won't go away. If there is a game, people will find a way to cheat. The standard way of thinking about the scientific method is ask a question, do a study, get an answer. But this notion is vastly oversimplified. Ask a question, do a study, get a partial or ambiguous answer, then do another study, and then do another to keep testing potential hypothesis and homing in on a more complete answer. 
If there are many retractions, or perhaps a lack of retractions when there are problems, can science be trusted? If we want science to be trusted, I feel there needs to be a culture shift from the top and bottom. But the pressure publishers are putting on the academic system don't seem to be helping, potentially causing many of the issues. One paper costing upwards of £20 compared to other publishers' subscriptions of around £30 for year-long access seems questionable, especially with that 40% profit margin. Scientific publishers argue undermining the publishing system would disrupt scholarly communications, be a disservice to researchers, and impinge academic freedom. Others saying... Uh, maybe we should think outside of the box of classical publications because scientific publishing has become this this very expensive monster. All publishers have their issues. The creator industry, with many of its own. But the more I think about scientific publishers, the more I question what they do in this digital era. Now I was going to end the video there, but Derek Muller from Veritasium said something at the end of his video that I think is appropriate to be added here. But despite this, I remain convinced that science is the best way to get at the truth. I mean, sure, in the short term, some may seek the spotlight by rushing the data analysis, overstating results, or circumventing peer review. But in the long term, that is not going to win you the Nobel Prize. Maybe not the most accurate claim as Nobel Prize winner Greg Semenza tallies 10th retraction, some related to image duplication and or manipulation. The bold claims, mistakes and dead ends, they will fade into oblivion. When and if the people fighting against the claims are heard, like with the recent Stanford president resignation, despite allegations lasting over 20 years across three different institutions. And only sound science that is vigorously tested and independently validated, that is what makes it into the accepted body of knowledge. But what is the accepted body of knowledge? Publication, discussion, practice, experience? I don't think that there is strict lines, rather dynamic perspectives. Digital literacy, lateral reading, critical and skeptical thinking skills to help us navigate the different perspectives. Yeah, I think science is the best thing we have right now, but I think and hope <laughs> there is improvements for the future. And I do want to say a thank you to those involved in the pre-published peer review. And if you do want to engage in further conversations with myself or anyone else in the pre-review, uh, you can join the Discord link in the description below.